we assumed that if people got access to electricity, solar light, didn't have to study over a dirty kerosene lantern, that children would do better in school. They don't. Um, and so that was humbling. Wow. Um, if you really want to get, if you really want to see kids' grades go up um, in very, very hot areas, get them a fan. It keeps the bugs out. They'll stay um, asleep during the night, which is also, you know, you need electricity, you need solar for that too. Um, so that's been extraordinary to listen to the market in that way. I'm your host, Adam Met, and today we're chatting with Jacqueline Novogratz, the founder and CEO of Acumen. In 1986, Jacqueline quit her Wall Street job and moved to Rwanda, where she co-founded the country's first microfinance institution. Fifteen years later, she founded Acumen, an organization dedicated to investing patient capital, bridging the gap between what's good for business and what's good for our planet. Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Jacqueline's most recent book is a love letter to the next generation. A quick reminder that we're planting a tree for every person who subscribes to this podcast, so make sure to hit that subscribe button. And without further ado, here is Jacqueline Novogratz on Planet Reimagined. Thank you so, so much for being here today. I am incredibly honored to speak to you. We are going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to dive into so many different topics. But first, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Adam, I'm so excited to be here, truly. Amazing, amazing. So I want to start out with something that we talk a lot about on this podcast, but it'll kind of live as an undercurrent through our conversation. We talk a lot about the sustainable development goals on this podcast. And goal number one is no poverty. And goal number 13 is climate action. And one of the points of these goals is that they're all interconnected and interrelated. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear from you, your views on the relationship between these two goals, between ending poverty and climate action. You know, when I started Acumen 20 years ago, I was very much focused on people, um, poverty, and, uh, and over the years, it's become so clear that when you're looking at poverty in this moment of history, it is impossible not also to understand and help people adapt to and become more resilient to climate change because climate crisis, which we are careening toward, has a disproportionate impact on, on the poor. Uh, when you look at farmers, 2.4, billion smallholder farmers represent 50% of people living in poverty. Uh, we work with them and watching locust swarms and um, desertification and one season where they'll be deluged with floods and then drought right after and then floods again have made it virtually impossible to plan, have decimated yields and have left um, poor people all that much more um, fragile and in deeper poverty. Um, I think we've seen something like 60 million displaced low-income people simply from climate in this year. And then it moves into refugees and immigration and displacement. And it's so naive for us, therefore, to think about only focusing on one or the other. And when Acumen looks at our next 10 years, Anam, the working at the nexus of poverty and climate, it's not even a choice for us. Mm. It is where we must put our, our emphasis. I want to talk a little bit about you first before we jump into to Acumen. So you've worked in various different sectors, uh, a lot in the financial space. So at Chase, the World Bank, UNICEF, Rockefeller Foundation, but in doing you know, some background research on you, your microfinance work in Rwanda seemed to be so incredibly influential on your career and, and your life. What was it about this approach to finance that inspired you so deeply? 
Hmm. Well, and it was the approach to, to finance that inspired me, but it was also the experience that was so particular to Rwanda in the 80s and 90s. Hmm. So the approach to finance was simply um, the brilliance of Muhammad Yunus and his contemporaries in the 70s who recognized that the poor were fully excluded from the financial system and yet credit is what allows us to actually interact with business and we have throughout history. And so either you were dependent on a money lender and sometimes paying four or five, 600% per year, as do many Americans even today with money lenders um, and payday lending, or um, you were lucky enough to exchange in a more of a barter situation, uh, in which case you could never gain the kind of income that you needed to buy things that were outside of pure sustainability, survival. So credit is necessary in the kind of economy in which we, we operate, but the poor had no access. So what was exciting to me was the single insight that our financial system depends on wealth. It depends on collateral uh, to get more wealth. Uh, Low-income people don't have that, but they have each other. And so uh, they're, again, forever been untraditional mutual aid associations where five women will get together and each one will put a dollar in a pot and at the end of the week, one gets the, the $5 and then at the, the next week, somebody else will. They may not talk about it as credit, but you're either a borrower or you're a lender, depending on where you sit in the circle. Muhammad Yunus took that and institutionalized it. That was the brilliance. And so for me in Rwanda, uh, really being able to interact at that level and start to understand the makings of an economy from the bottom up changed my whole understanding of people and processes fundamentally. Um, why Rwanda in that particular time, it was a nation that was just leaving barter, full on agricultural uh, sustainability into a more modern economy. And um, that also was an incredible opportunity. Women for the first time had access to a bank account without their husband's signature. So I started to see the confluence of credit and human rights, where this was a right now, not just um, a, a right for some people. Uh, and that brought with it challenges around building people's capabilities so that they could interact with the market and so on and so on. And then of course, um, the genocide, um, which uh, changed my whole understanding of human beings fundamentally um, and came uh, in ways that I would never have anticipated um, whereby the women with whom I had started this bank played uh, every conceivable role including being one of the planners of the genocide. So um, I would say it was an all in experience in terms of changing who I am fundamentally as a person and how I, I see the world. Wow. That is an incredible story. One of the pieces that you mentioned is about capabilities and pointing out and elevating and increasing people's capabilities. And I think that's a really important point because that is central to the human rights conversation. There is an approach in human rights called the capabilities approach to human rights, where you're really focused on local on the ground approaches to giving people access to fulfill all of their potential. And I, I really love thinking about it in terms of that, as opposed to high level treaties set at the international level. It, it, it's really difficult to conceptualize what's going on on the ground when you think of it in big legal concepts, as opposed to this is affecting one individual person in this community or this set of of women that you're talking about that are doing this barter system and opening up their capability to be creditors and debtors to each other. It's, it's really incredible. So let's jump into Acumen. Founded Acumen in 2001 based on this idea of patient capital. So just to kind of give a baseline for everybody listening, 
what is this approach and why is it better than traditional market solutions or something like philanthropy or charity? So the big idea that 20, 20 years ago, patient capital was that um, traditional markets too often overlook or exploit the poor. Uh, aid or charity too often creates dependency. Um, neither take the time to actually sit on the ground and listen to who low income people are um, in ways that treat them as customers, meaning in ways that really understand what they value, can afford, um, want to access and build from that perspective. So patient capital um, takes philanthropy, which should be the most risk oriented capital that we have. It invests it in entrepreneurs that are going where both markets and governments have failed the poor. Just look at the SDGs, you know, electricity, education, healthcare, on and on. Um, patient is 10 to 15 years. Patient is allowing the entrepreneur to build markets where they have never existed before. So they are tautologically going to fail at times, but you will accompany them. And so patient capital also requires that we um, support them with the non-financial. Um, use our social capital, connect them to corporations for their supply chains and universities and grant makers so that long-term they can build a financially sustainable, profitable company that serves a client base that makes two, three, four dollars a day. Any money that comes back is reinvested um, in other innovation for the poor. And that was the original model. Over time, we've evolved to do three things. On the capital front, we not only invest the patient capital, philanthropic back to pioneer new markets and in, in, in entirely new business models. As those models grow, we've also then created now four for-profit um, facilities, more traditional impact investing, so that we can help them gain, raise much significant amounts of capital. Mm -hmm. The second thing is understanding that human capital is equally, if not more important than financial capital. And that's Acumen Academy, where we invest in leaders. And the third piece is we measure what matters, um, that you can't talk about impact if you can't measure that impact. And so we've built an impact system called Lean Data from the perspective of the poor themselves, where we'll text thousands of customers of a company deduced from the answers that they give, their income levels, how their lives have changed, what they like, what they don't like, et cetera, uh, to feed back to the entrepreneur and align um, the interests of the customers, the entrepreneurs and acumen and other investors as well. And that's recently been spun off as a company called Lean uh, 60 Decibels. Amazing. I, I want to ask one more question, which may, you know, devolve into a few more questions as it as it has. Um, but the book that you released in 2020, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, I have a specific question about technological revolutions and moral revolutions. So it's clear that, you know, the world is not going to stop innovating and pushing itself forward for technological developments. How do we ensure that these goals of grasping at the future don't supersede our current moral maxims, let alone this new sense of morality that you're advocating for? Well, just like money, technology is, it's simply a means, it's a tool. Mm -hmm. um, and where we fall short as human beings is we see profit or money as the end in and of itself, mm -hmm. as do we see technology as the end. And so the whole conversation is AI rather than how do we control this rather than let it control us? I think that is the essential question. In so many ways, I'm seeing a new generation develop completely different business models um, based on putting the poor first and building from that per and the earth mm -hmm. and building from that perspective and then figuring out the right kind of capital and the right kind of technology to do it. And some of them are creating completely radical ways of doing business and doing it successfully. My 
favorite thing about our conversation today? Well, first, I'm sure that many people have called you inspirational because of the work that you do. And I find you incredibly inspirational. But the fact that you talk about all of these specific, especially women around the world, with so much awe and reverence, it's very clear that all of these people around the world continue to inspire you. And that is so incredible to see that, you know, people who are starting to build their careers now, whether it's an impact investment or regenerative agriculture or whatever it is that are trying to help the planet, that you continue to go back and find inspiration in the people who are working in these countries that need the most help at the level where they're just supporting their families and have these ideas and investing not only capital in them, but your work and your energy and your time. And so I think that's going to be incredibly inspiring for so many people listening to the podcast. So thank you for sharing that framing of it, because I think that's so important for people to hear. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, people say to me, because I, somebody was lucky to find mentors in my life, you know, who are your mentors now? And I, are you kidding? I look at young people and they're so much smarter than I ever was. <laughs> and they truly, they stand on so much more knowledge than I ever did. And, um, and there's an opportunity right now to turn capitalism upside down, to truly reimagine it. And so whether it's, um, finding ways to build true sustainability into our agriculture mm -hmm. um, in the chocolate industry, in the coffee industry, breaking all the rules mm -hmm. uh, and succeeding. How could that not be the most inspiring um, way, the way to live? And for me, I am learning so much from them that I can barely keep up with them. And um, my job is just you know, to keep being the cheerleader and connecting them and, um, and doing what I can to try to change the narrative away from one that sees success as the same old, same old money, power, fame, and says, no, there is a new generation that is defining success based on putting our humanity in the earth at the center of our systems and and seeing what kind of energy they can release in other people. And I wanna lift those role models and I wanna lift those business models. And if, if that's what I can do, then I'm not stopping this work. I so, so, so appreciate you taking the time today. You've inspired me. I'm gonna go get to work right now. It was <laughs> lovely to meet you. Thank you for spending time with us today. Adam, thank you. And I actually think you are one who works enough um, that we have to have some rest, contemplation, a little joy, and a lot of beauty too. But it's just so exciting. And I love this podcast. And I wish you and everyone who's listening um, all good things on this path uh, that has a lot, you know, it's not an easy path. It's a hard path, but it's a path that has such beauty in it as well. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.